Good morning, everybody, and especially good morning to Dave Smithy, who I am responding to personally in video. He has taken a very long time to write out a very succinct but very long response to something I said on one of the SoCar videos, and I feel this is the best way to address it. It's going to be a very long video because the comment was very long. So long, in fact, that you have to literally go to a Google document and it takes a good 10 minutes to read, even if you are speed reading. So I know that this is going to be quite arduous to go through, but for the sake of love and concern for Dave Smithy and the rest of the royal family, my sincere prayer is that they will hear me out and listen to everything I have to say in response to what Dave said. I think we should just get straight into it. So here it goes. What I'm going to do is read portions of what he said and then respond to it. Dave said to me, Hi, Brother Tris. Thank you for your response to my comment. So my loyalty is only to the one whom I bow my knee, that is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Well, let's just stop right there. Absolutely. Amen. The trouble is, is that people have a different version of who Jesus is. And do we serve the same Lord Jesus Christ, my friend? That's what we need to assimilate here. Because if you are in heresy, if we do not have the same doctrines, then we have to go to scripture as the final authority. And this is the whole issue here. This is why Sokar exists. This is why we take great pains to go through the doctrines of the royal family to see whether we are of the same faith. We are examining exactly what's going on here. And in all honesty, and I believe with complete fairness, the very least we can take from the findings of Sokar is that we do not serve the same Lord Jesus Christ right now. Also, I would say that your loyalty is seemingly to the Lord Jesus Christ, but I would say it's much more to Pete Cabrera and his ministry, because as far as I can see from where I'm sat, he has stolen your original loyalty to sound doctrine and has bewitched you, or at least the evil spirits inside of him have bewitched you, to follow a false gospel. And that is what we are trying to show you explicitly, not just you, but everybody else. But let's carry on. Dave goes on to say, you should know there's a difference between heresy, not citing the exact chapter and verse in scripture, and not understanding how to rightly divide the word of God. Okay, well, look, I understand your point, but the problem we have in Sokar, having reviewed hours and hours of Pete's teachings, is that he's guilty of all of them, not just one of them individually, just one off. This is the whole point. He's guilty of heresy. He doesn't cite the exact chapter and verse in scripture it's not about citing the actual numbers. He's literally getting the scripture completely bamboozledly wrong and not understanding how to rightly divide the word of God. This is a very interesting statement because what you're actually saying is we are the only ones who rightly divide the word of God. What you are actually saying there, if you are to take the royal family doctrine seriously, is to say that you, your whole movement, your whole ministry are the only ones who understand how to rightly divide the word of God. Everybody else is wrong. No one else on the planet believes like you do. You go on to say, I see that most believers do not know how to draw from the Holy Spirit, but continue to walk out their faith in the flesh instead of walking out the faith of Christ in the Spirit. Well, what you see is obviously very biased according to what you believe. What you don't understand is we do draw from the Holy Spirit here at BDS. I do at least. I definitely am led by him in many ways. And one of the ways was to directly come against the ministry of identity teachers, because this is a foul heresy. And we have taken great pains to show you why that is, why this emphasis, which as you later go on to say is not explicitly mentioned in scripture, has become an idol for you people at the expense of what the Bible says about other doctrines that also need to be taken into account, you see, because of your willful ignorance of other necessary doctrines that need to be taken into account. There is a massive leaning towards what you have interpreted in the scriptures, which has blinded your minds. And that is why Sokar exists, the school of correction and rebuke, full stop. I'm sure you're very aware of a proverb about how an open rebuke is better than hidden love. Later on, you say you studied the book of Proverbs intensely for six months because that's all you had to read. Well, then you know this scripture very well. And so I don't know why you aren't taking into account this as a reason why we consider ourselves concerned enough to actually directly come against many of the teachings of what is coming from the royal pulpit over there in Kansas. You said again, 
I see that most believers do not know how to draw from the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God within them, but continue to walk out their faith in the flesh instead of walking out the faith of Christ in the Spirit. They have not learned the mind of Christ and lack the understanding of how to abide in the doctrine of Christ. Then you go on to say, this is sometimes referred to as identity teaching, quote unquote, but like the word quote unquote trinity, you don't find it in the scripture, rather it is referred to in the scripture as the Godhead. There are many leaps in interpretation you've made here. First of all, that your interpretation of abiding in the doctrine of Christ is directly linked to identity teaching, which is not true at all. There is an element of knowing one's identity in Christ, but in the same way that one is simply born into a family, one knows instinctively who their mother is, who their father is. In the same way, when one is born of the Spirit, and especially in my own testimony, when I first met the Lord Jesus Christ, I instantly knew that he was my Lord. I knew his voice because I was a sheep of his. And when he finally revealed himself to me on that fateful day, I absolutely unequivocally knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was in his kingdom and I identified that I was one of his sheep. It wasn't something I had to learn over time. It was something that was revealed to me instantaneously and is still to this day, 15 years later or so, the foundation of my faith. But it's not the emphasis of my teaching to other people. One cannot simply learn an identity. It's something that is innate. Someone who does not have the Spirit of Christ in them does not know him at all. You have to have the Spirit in you. And I guess that's what you're referring to when you say not knowing how to draw the kingdom of God within them, but continuing to walk out their faith in the flesh. Well, this is a very disingenuous thing because to say that we are walking in the flesh when actually we are doing what the Lord Jesus Christ is asking us to do, which is to come against and expose major heresy. Dave goes on to say, I think you see the point. The revelation of who we are in Christ is what the Apostle Paul was learning by the Holy Spirit, teaching others and walking in himself. Submitting to God is something we learn to do through renewing our minds to the realities of God's glory, being in his presence and manifesting the fruits of the Spirit. We grow in the knowledge of Christ and this can only be accomplished by hearing and doing the word of God. Well, Dave, my answer to that is the Apostle Paul was showing us how to follow the Lord Jesus Christ with all our heart, soul, and mind. His purpose wasn't to show ignoramuses that didn't know they were sons of God, that they were actually sons of God and helping them have this self-realization moment. He was teaching and adding revelation to what it looks like to abide in Christ. He was showing us how we abide in him so that we can be proven on the day of judgment to show the fruits that we truly did listen to and know him because there will be many on that day saying lord lord did we not do great miracles did we not cast out demons did we not do all sorts of different spiritual practices and beneficial things for your kingdom and he will turn to those people and say i never knew you depart from me you who work iniquity or in other words you who agree with evil this is the key. You cannot just say, I know the Lord. I follow the Lord. The Lord knows me. The Lord is the one who makes that call, not us. If we know him or not, we'll show in our actions, in the way we treat others, in the way that we live our lives. It shows in the spiritual fruit we have with each other. There are all sorts of manifestations to know the Lord Jesus Christ personally. And to be honest, if I was judging many of those who are in your ministry by their fruits, I have to raise my eyebrows and think, well, it's not the same Lord that I serve. And to deny the flesh means to understand how evil spirits attack us and how we agree with them according to the lusts of our flesh so that we cast down imaginations, resist the devil, submitting to God by doing so, and then the devil flees. Then there is no more legal right for the demon to be in your flesh anymore, which is when physical deliverance takes place. Interestingly, I know why people who are associated with the identity gospel hate this kind of theology. It's because it sounds negative. Instead of realizing ourselves to be this great, perfect being made completely holy simply by uttering the name Jesus and realizing ourselves to be who we were always created to be as far as you were concerned, to understand that there are literal beings that need exorcising like someone who exterminates rats would be called in for pest control. So this is destructive and negative 
and not worth bearing thinking about to people like you because it's so anti what you actually believe, which is why you are fully against deliverance ministries. And that's why we are fully against you proponing your identity gospel. Your theology is the flattering lips that lead people into iniquity, the same iniquity that the Lord was talking about when he said, I never knew you. Whereas we are far more concerned with self-examination, understanding our agreements with darkness and fighting tooth and nail to try to overcome our agreements with the spirits that dwell in our flesh, which were either inherited by blood or sexually transmitted, or we open the doorway ourselves to sin before we were even born again. And now those evil spirits have a right to be within the temple polluting it. Once we are born again, the Lord Jesus Christ then starts the work of sanctification, the purification process, to oust the pests that now inhabit the flesh with strongholds, working with us as we work with him to come out of alignment with what they want and saying, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, even within ourselves. That process can only happen when you were born again, because when we are first saved, what we're actually saved from is from the bondage of sin, aka the power of the bondage of the strongholds that demons hold us in, in our flesh as they dwell there, legally so that we can work out our salvation with fear and trembling, walking humbly with the Lord God, enduring to the end, so that we might get there on Judgment Day with a really great hope in the blood of Christ. Even though we are saved only by the blood of Christ, our faith is proved by works, but it's the works of the Spirit that the Lord Jesus Christ personally takes credit for on the Day of Judgment and not us. And what are those works? They are predominantly the works of deliverance, aka conforming to the expectations of holiness, being in agreement with godliness, and in active disagreement with perversion and corruption that any self-aware, self-examining, born-again Christian is aware of day after day within their own members. So, Dave goes on to say, a born-again believer does not know how to do this, does not understand how to walk out the kingdom of God in power, as Paul demonstrated, and therefore needs to be discipled in the truth of what Jesus did for them and to them at the cross. The Holy Spirit teaches, but Jesus calls us to make disciples. Most Christians do not know the other side of the cross, which is complete and total victory, always in Christ. Well, let's stop there for a minute. Dave, when someone is born again, they are spiritually very immature, of course, but there is an element to the understanding that they've received from the Holy Spirit to do with their knowledge of the wickedness they've been involved in all of their lives, which they now have to turn away from and actively fight for the rest of their lives. In order to walk out the power of the kingdom of God, one needs to be totally submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ and preaching his true gospel in order for the signs and wonders to follow them. To be discipled in the truth of what Jesus did for us and to us at the cross, one actually has to understand the bad news as well as the good news that follows that. The good news being the gospel, but of course the bad news which precedes that, which is we are wicked and inherently prone with agreeing with darkness, aka the evil spirits that tempt us according to our lust, which are dwelling in the flesh. You say that most Christians do not know the other side of the cross, which is complete and total victory, always in Christ. Well, sir, that is because you will not know that complete victory until you've completely overcome and having endured unto the end. You will not know that victory until the Lord Jesus Christ literally says to you on judgment day, come good and faithful servant into the kingdom that was prepared for you by my father. Before you take that last breath, it is a fight to the end. And no one has total victory except the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that is leading us on the straight and narrow path towards that victory. And if we abide in him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And on that day, we will say nothing of our own works that he has enabled us to do this side of the grave. Rather, we will be totally submissive to the fact that he has produced any works of value in the spirit through us, this side of the grave. 
And here's the irony between the ministries that we're involved in. For us, most believers don't understand that they have evil spirits dwelling in their flesh, which is why they have absolutely no defenses when they are tempted with evil. They think it is outside of them, whereas it's actually coming from within. Those strongholds are within the soul and their bodies are enacting what the agreements are from the soul when they experience the temptation. And I've said many times that this really is the true revelation the church needs to get in order to be a powerhouse in this world. And once that happens, you can guarantee that people will start to hate us and not love us. Why? Because we are pointing out evil and we are not going with the world's rhetoric that we are inherently good people who just slip up from time to time, whereas it's completely the other way around. Round. And maybe if you're honest with yourselves, that's why you guys really, really strongly dislike us, because we are pointing out the faults and damnable heresies that your ministry is involved in, and you don't like it. In fact, you don't like it so much that you have to just ignore it now without even being able to retaliate in any scriptural form, because you have no leg to stand on in that regard. Dave then goes on to say, Now you may say I only have 37 years of being in Christ, so I still have some growing to do, and I would agree. (laughs) Mate, I'm just going to be honest with you. I know people who've been born again for 37 days who know more than you do. It seems like you've completely missed something about real Christianity here, if you truly are born again. To be born of the Spirit is to understand how the Spirit realm works, and what is going on in the Spirit realm to do with the Spirit war that we are all involved in. And to say that you have have some growing to do is a complete understatement from where I'm sat. Any one of us would agree that we've got growing to do once we're born again. In fact, the road is very narrow and only a few ever find it, which probably means that we need to be focused and willing to submit ourselves to the fact that we are wrong about a lot of things, especially to do with how deeply the Lord wants to take us down into the depths of our soul to show us what he doesn't like about us so we can change. That is what sanctification is, you see. But then you go on to say, but the one thing I have known from my first month to this present day in the kingdom of God is how Jesus told us we would know one another. Okay, well, with that in mind, please bear in mind the fact that I've spent days doing this video for you. Why have I done that? Well, it's because I see something of the Spirit of God in you, sir. It's because I see a loyalty and a love and a willingness to want to know what's actually going on. But what I've actually seen from you, this undivided loyalty to Pete's Gnostic ministry, is that you have been deeply, deeply, deeply deceived. To the point where I desperately fear for your soul. And so if I do know you at all in the spirit, it's just that you are a complete babe in Christ, however many years you think you've been following him, and that I'm trying to grab your hand before you walk in the traffic and get run over by a truck. Because you guys are completely oblivious to how the devil attacks, you have no idea that he has already been devouring you to the point where there is a very great delusion going on possibly irreversibly. In spite of the fact that Paul exhorts us to know the wiles of the devil and not be unaware of his schemes, you are completely oblivious to how he attacks. And that is the reason for this video. In fact, it's actually the reason for this channel. And to be honest, after this, if you can't receive what we're saying, I just have to treat you like a tax collector or an unbeliever, because this is my personal final outreach to you. However, I'm intending to fully answer every query you brought up in your very long essay that you sent me. You say, what I see with Sokar in general is a lack of maturity, and so I rely on the Holy Spirit to encourage all believers into a greater understanding of what it is they carry. The foundation of the faith is first believing and then knowing Jesus. Just as Jesus, Spirit of God in brackets, is the word made flesh, truth in brackets, so now are we flesh, in brackets, with born again spirit, being transformed by the word, in brackets, by the renewing of our minds and the quickening of our spirit, so that our lives will resemble that of the firstborn of God. This is what scripture reveals and what identity teaching confirms, the word of God. Well, Dave, my response to that is to know the word of God, you have to agree with the authority of scripture. And that is the final authority. And that is what we're bringing to the table here without any legible, coherent response back from your ministry.
Actually, I want you to know that the entire ministry you're a part of and the culmination of everything you've written to me here makes me feel like this. In fact, the fundamental error you're making is, is that the flesh can be born again, whereas our spirits are born again, which the Lord uses in order to teach us to have mastery over the flesh, where the temptations come from, from what dwells in the flesh, that the flesh is submitted to the spirit, even as it is written, the flesh lusteth against the spirit. When scripture is talking about the word of God, it's not just talking about the Lord Jesus Christ personally. It's talking about the actual scripture. For example, in Hebrews, where it's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That is the word of God. The spirit of God has written these words. They are God-breathed. And that is what we attack the devil back with. Every other part of the Ephesians' armor of God is defensive pretty much, except for the sword of the Spirit, by which we joust and thrust towards any lies that are thrown our way so that we can discern what is being said and know whether it's of God or not. Because half-truths are very believable, much more believable than outright lies. And that is why the word of wisdom is given to those who pray for it by the Spirit, as well as a word of knowledge by the same Spirit. That is why we need to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly, in all wisdom. Because people who love wisdom love to know when they're wrong about something, when their wrong motives have taken over, when they've agreed with the darkness. And the rebukes from brothers are invaluable because they see something you particularly can't. But they have to come in the authority of Scripture, and that's the point. It's the point because people can come rebuking you in the spirit of the devil as the accuser and deceiver and whatever else. And so we've got to measure it against what the Lord Jesus Christ has revealed in his scriptures in order to know whether this person is right or wrong about it and study it and take it on board and try to discern what spirit is saying what. It's a double-edged sword. The Lord Jesus Christ might be the firstborn of all creation, but he's also the only begotten son. We are adopted into his kingdom. But perhaps soberly and terrifyingly, we can be grafted out of the tree. We can be cut off the vine to be burned as worthless branches. That is a very real possibility on this side of the grave, which is why we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, because that's a real possibility when you stop abiding in Christ. Therefore, I put to you that the only identity that one can take from the word of God ministering to us is that the only begotten son of God, the one we need to abide in, he has his full identity in Jehovah. And if we are to stand any chance of any hope on the day of judgment in order to be finally saved, we need to put all of our hope and faith in him so that we are covered with his mantle of grace so that we can find the total and complete complete liberation from our sinful nature and agreement with darkness. This actually leads beautifully into what I want to say to what you say next, which is this. I know so many Christians whose lives are devastated by divorce, disease, financial distress, internal turmoil, failed relationships, inability to hold jobs, depression, anxiety, and fatigue. They love God and they study the word, go to church and participate in their community. They have not discovered how to live in the new creation, how to live a life hidden in Christ, how to walk in the total blessings of the new covenant an abundant life full of the riches of their inheritance in the saints. It is heartbreaking because we are the light of the world. Praise God, he made us light bearers. We carry his light. So referring to what I was saying earlier, can you not see that those Christians who do not understand that they have evil spirits in them, that are completely unaware of how they attack them, that have absolutely no idea they have strongholds that they need to pray and fast over and seek the Lord daily and have the volition to submit to the Lord and deny their flesh on a daily basis, the lusts of the flesh that are so enticing and so inviting and so rewarding in the short term, and the fact that they are involved in unrepented sin because they are unaware that this is a continual 
whole process of sanctification and recognizing on a daily basis when we get it wrong, to hear the Spirit of God tell us when we get it wrong in real time. Therefore, when they go to take their communion and they haven't examined themselves, they are leaving themselves open to being condemned, as the scriptures warn us about. Those people haven't got a clue that they are working for their salvation rather than relying on and abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ. You say they love God and study the word and go to church and participate in their community. Those kind of people are the kind of people that will say, Lord, Lord, did we not do that on that day? Yet they were working iniquity. Why? Because they were not focused on what the evil spirits had them in agreement with. And they remained in unrepentance and therefore remained unforgiven, especially if they were being unforgiving themselves, which is a very common problem in the church. You know so many Christians who think they've been liberated when actually they've been so demonized to the point where they don't believe there's any kind of spiritual war anymore, as Dan Moller would preach, which is the same gospel you're trying to preach to me right now, which is this abundant life full of the riches of their inheritance in the saints. There also seems to be a misunderstanding here. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Because his spirit is in us when we are born again, we can reciprocate like receptacles, like transmitters, his light to the rest of the world. But we don't do that solely through signs and wonders. They follow what the gospel is. And the only way you can increase your relationship intensity with the Lord is to fight the wickedness and darkness that is within your own being. Without that, those strongholds remain unchallenged. And so while someone's spirit is born again, the flesh still has mastery, which is why people have bondages to depression, anxiety, and sexual sin, even after they truly believe and know unequivocally that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Because no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. And that's the disconnect for you. The flesh will never be born again. That is why it has to be fought tooth and nail and resisted. And unless someone is aware that they have to do that, the flesh will have mastery because it's meant to go this way round once you are born again. The spirit has mastery over the soul and therefore the body and the body becomes subject to the spirit. Whereas when someone is not aware that the mastery is in the flesh, even though they've been born again of the spirit, it is quenched. Why is it quenched? Because those people remain entrenched in sin because the flesh is dictating to the soul what it needs to do and the spirit is ignored. And that is the very definition of the foolish virgin who does not have enough oil in the lamp. So here we get to a break in the letter where it has to be extended in order to actually read it further. And I'm going to leave the rest of it in the description or in the comments so people can peruse it at their own pace. But instead of individually addressing everything in detail as I have up till now, I'm just going to respond with a parable. So obviously there's a misconception in the church that everybody who is rough or strict or pokes the flesh and makes you uncomfortable is a wolf. And that's not true. There are such things as sheepdogs. If we're sheep as the body of Christ, Christ calls us his sheep. He's the pastor. He's the shepherd. He has also designated sheepdogs, if you like. (laughs) They are sheep as well. Obviously, that's where the parable breaks down. But there are such things as sheep dogs to keep the sheep in line, to direct them in a certain way. If we look at this sheep dog right now, he's trying to push them in a certain direction. He's making them through training, knowing where they should go, trying to keep them all together and in line, kind of nipping at the heels. The sheep are kind of afraid of him a little bit. And there's the shepherd there who's guiding the sheepdog with whistles and directions and whatever, trying to get the dog to do what he wants the sheep to do, essentially. And that dog is very well trained. The other dog there isn't interested at all. That's, I guess, the false shepherds in the church, those people who are just doing things for their own benefit. But the other dog, he's a working dog. He's pushing the sheep to go in the direction that the shepherd wants. And that's the point. You need some kind of almost aggressive or violent attitude in order to do that because sheep tend not to want to go where the shepherd wants them. Anyone who knows about my ministry knows that there's a a lot of experience to do with sheep because I grew up on a sheep farm. And as we can see, you need a shepherd who has a trained sheepdog in order to get the sheep to do what the shepherd wants 
to do. Obviously, the shepherd can't do that unless he's on a quad bike or something. This is the old fashioned English or Irish sheepdog way to guide the sheep. But then we go somewhere with this other little dog who really isn't made for this job, really. It's not his calling, let's say. And he's trying to shepherd the sheep, but the sheep are literally turning on him and chasing him. And he's running around being chased by these sheep. He has got no control of them whatsoever. The sheep are just doing whatever they want. The shepherd isn't having the sheep go where he wants them to go. And the whole thing's a complete mess, basically. And now that sheepdog, quote unquote, is uh, a big failure, right? The thing about the wolves is they want to ravage the flock. They want to eat the flock. They want to tear apart the flock. A sheepdog has no such desire. Its desire is to listen to the shepherd and do what the shepherd wants them to do. It might seem unloving, rough, whatever else to the sheep, but actually it's for their benefit. They're going into greener pastures. They're being taken into the barn for the winter. They're being guided in a kind of rough way to get there. That's the difference between a wolf and a sheepdog. A sheepdog is taking the sheep where they need to go. The wolf is actually there just to have a feast. And the false sheepdog, if you like, the the one who doesn't have that calling, is bullied, bludgeoned by the sheep because he has no authority and he has no right to be in charge uh, because he's too small, he's not strong enough, whatever else. He's just not built for that that particular job. So of course, when the wolves start to attack the sheep, when they're in the pen, they just have free reign because unless the sheepdog is around or if the shepherd's not around in some kind of explicit fashion, the wolves just have a field day. It's easy pickings. Sheep are easy to kill if you're a wolf and they just tear apart the flock seeking who they might devour, and the rest of them are waiting in line for their own demise as the wolves have their feast ripping apart defenseless animals in comparison to the sharp fangs of a wolf. But obviously when the sheepdog notices, when it hears that the sheep are being ravaged, it comes to the rescue. It's on its way. It's up for the fight. It will take the wolves on head first, even if they're ganging up on him. In this particular one, it's one against two. One sheepdog, two wolves. But he's tough. And now there are other sheepdogs getting in on the act. The sheepdog are checking the sheep. Now the shepherds are involved, leading the sheepdog to try and attack the wolf back so it will stay away. And there's the moral of the story. The wolves are held at bay. The rest of the sheep are protected. And the sheepdog has done his job, which is firstly and foremostly to obey the shepherd by protecting the sheep, his flock, from the wolves who are just looking for a meal. Does the sheepdog and do the wolves look like they are fellowshipping? Do they look like they love each other? Do they look like they should love each other? Of course not. Why? Because wolves are attacking the sheep and the sheepdog is trying to protect them. This isn't a place to try and iron out their differences. This is actual warfare. And whoever loses gets attacked, gets eaten alive and will probably lose their life. And in the case of the sheepdog, will lose a lot of other lives. Whereas all the wolves have to lose is their meal and potentially their life should the sheepdog attack back well enough. I think you understand the parable. Okay, Dave, for the sake of time, I'm just going to kind of flick through these last points that you made and address them. You make a good deal of effort to compare Chris LaSala to Pete Cabrera Jr., but how ironic it is that you are judging Pete on his fruits when you don't know Chris LaSala at all, and yet you say it's very easy for someone to be deceived by someone's outward appearance of saying, love, blessings, I bless you in the name of Jesus, blah, 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 and yet you can't see that they are acting, whereas someone who seems way harder to you, who doesn't seem to have the kind of rhetoric in the public eye that you're seeking from an outward appearance, is easily judged as an unrighteous person. But you go further than that as well, because you are actually coming against the ministry of Soka here, which I'm involved in. And you are saying that this is a one-dimensional attack on one person, because Pete is the most obvious heretic that has ever lived ever, as we've taken great pains to document. And to be quite honest, if you can't see that, you're completely lost, because it's very evident that you idolize this man. Do you not know, for example, that Chris personally invited Pete Cabrera down to BDS at the conference I was at last year? offering to pay for his plane ticket and everything, food, whatnot, in order to show Pete that he is wrong on this doctrine and he was ignored. Do you think that's an unloving thing to do? Because I do. 
He literally had no time because he knows he's wrong. He is a hireling. He is a deceiver. He is not in the body of Christ. You say that our names are written in the book of life not because of getting words wrong or inability to pronounce something correctly. But we're not talking about just the average person, we're talking about a teacher, no, a professor of a university, nonetheless, who is proclaiming things from a pulpit that are completely untrue. By that very fact alone, he is subject to a greater scrutiny and a greater judgment in the end. You say that what you see coming from Sokar does not appear as genuine, sincere and edifying, that it isn't iron sharpening, but I beg to differ. To me, it means you've never even watched any of these videos, if that's the case. I think these are some of the most edifying iron sharpening videos on the internet, let alone a seeming outward attack on one person. This is to edify the sheep, but maybe you're a goat, that's why you can't see it. The use of mockery is because of the persistent denial and refusal to acknowledge what we're saying. It's got to the point where we're just going to take the mickey out of this completely obvious reprobate, or should I say reprimint. And right at the end there where you threaten in a low-key way that you've been a CEO who's been to court a few times and have won most of your cases, as far as I'm concerned, you've got absolutely no legal leg to stand on. I think I've made a very good case as to why Sokar is operating and acting in love, care and concern, and that you are completely missing the point. And I think everybody else in the entire world who's nothing to do with the cult you're in can see that. None of us are saying we're devoid of problems. None of us are saying we haven't got evil spirits ourselves. In fact, that's the point. We are all saying that you're wrong about being perfected, that you have no issues, that heaven is already in you, etc., etc. Whereas what we're saying is we know our faults. We know we do things wrong, yet it's unwillful. And we will address it when it's pointed out to us and not ignore it like the people at your ministry do. You say you think there's a better way we can do this. I beg to differ. You tell us what it is and we might do it, but I guarantee it won't work because you people are willfully ignorant of what we're saying. You do not address any of the scriptures that we're bringing up and you do not address any of the allegations against you either. And so for the purpose of edifying the body of Christ and warning against the wolves that are ravaging the flock right now, we are going to continue in this vein. Unless you can persuade me that there's another way that's going to work better. But I think we both know that's not going to happen. And right at the end, you mentioned Acts 5.38. And yes, you are right. Let's see which ministry is standing in 10 years time. The proof is in the pudding, David. God bless you. I hope you have received something from what I've been saying and that it's going to cause you to meditate on what's going on right now because you are a victim at the moment and you are not a victor. And having said that, none of us are victorious until we take that last breath and we open our eyes into eternity, into the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, where he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Come into my kingdom, receive your mansion, the place where there's no more tears, no more suffering and no more warfare. Until then, this is a battle and you're the type of person that's making daisy chains while the rest of us have guns trying to fight the enemy. That is literally at the doorstep about to raise the whole place to the ground. And I truly hope that there will be a blessing from Jehovah the Father for everybody concerned in this back and forth between our ministries. In Jesus' name. Amen.